Recipe, hangover mac and cheese. For the full immersive experience, eat this in your pajamas in front of Made in Manhattan or a documentary about a serial killer. 350 green pasta. Macaroni or penne works well. 35G butter. 35 green plain flour. 500 ml whole milk. 200 gram grated cheddar cheese. 100 gram grated red Leicester cheese. 100 gram grated Parmesan cheese. Unduan TBSP English mustard. Bunch of spring onions, chopped. Dash of Worcestershire sauce. One small ball of mozzarella cheese, torn into pieces. Salt and black pepper to season. Olive oil to drizzle. In a large pan of boiling water, cook the pasta for eight minutes so it is slightly undercooked. It will continue to cook when you bake it. Drain and set aside, stirring olive oil through it so it doesn't stick together. In a separate large pan, melt the butter. Mix in the flour and keep cooking for a few minutes, stirring all the time until the mixture forms a roux paste. Whisk in the milk little by little and cook over a low heat for 10 to 15 minutes. Keep stirring all the time and cook until you have a smooth and glossy sauce that gradually thickens. Off the heat, add around three quarters of the cheddar, red Leicester, and Parmesan into the sauce, along with the mustard, some salt and pepper, the chopped onions, and a dash of Worcestershire sauce, and keep stirring until it is all melted. Preheat the grill as high as it will go. Pour the pasta into the sauce and mix everything together in a baking dish. Stir in the mozzarella, then sprinkle over the remaining cheddar, red Leicester, and Parmesan. Grill or place into a hot oven at 200 degrees six for 15 minutes until the mixture is golden and bubbling with a crisp top. The Bad Date Diaries, a hotel on a main road in Ealing. It is my first Christmas back from university, and I have a full-time job as a salesgirl at L.K. Bennett in Bond Street. Debbie, the glamorous fashion student, who always makes the highest commission, paints my lips Vivian Lee red in the changing room, ready for a big date. The man is called Grayson, and I met him at York Uni when visiting a school friend there a month previously. I was waiting at the student union bar to buy two vodka diet Cokes when someone grabbed my hand. Grayson, lanky, pale, interesting, Elvis eyes smudged in a cloud of eyeliner, turned my palm over. Three children. You'll die at 90. He looked at me. You've been here before, he whispered dramatically. He is the first person of my age I have ever met who chooses not to be on Facebook. I think he is Sartre. We meet under a giant Christmas tree, and he takes me to a martini bar, because he remembers I said it was my favorite drink. At this point, I am still in the training myself to like martinis phase, so worry he'll see my first sip wince, but I manage to hold it together. We then move on to the oldest pub in London where I drink strawberry beer. He shows me a set of keys. His boss has given him a hotel room for the night. He never explains why. Three buses later, in the time it takes for him to explain to me why London has been more of a parent to me than my parents have, we arrive at a dingy hotel in a converted suburban home on a main road in Ealing. I don't want to sleep with him because I want to get to know him better. So we spend all night lying in the bed, staring at the off-white ceiling, and talk about our 18 years so far. He is the son of a very old, very elegant, very rich man who was the last of the colonizers and discovered a rare type of fish on his travels, wrote a book about it, and has lived off the money ever since. I am agog with wonder. We fall asleep at five. Early the next morning, Grayson has to go to work. He kisses me, says goodbye, and leaves a peach pastry on the bedside table. That's the last time we ever see each other. I will spend the following five years constantly wondering if Grayson was just an actor looking for a gullible audience and an escape from himself for a night. If it was all made up, the palm reading, the hotel, the fish, the eyeliner, then years and years later, I will fall for a biology PhD student who will become the great love of my life. One Sunday night, I will be lying on his bed in his jumper and he will get out a book to read before we sleep about a man who discovered a fish. I will grab it off him and look at the inside cover to see a photograph of a man with the same face and surname as Grayson. 
The boyfriend will ask why I am laughing. Because it was all real, I will say, and it was so ridiculous. The Bad Party Chronicles, Cobham, New Year's Eve, 2007. There must be something happening, I say to Farley as we watch our 13th episode of Friends while slumped across the sofa at my mum's house at 5 p.m. on New Year's Eve. We're 19 years old. We have to be able to find a party somewhere. I send a seemingly personal message out to everyone in my phone book. Our friend Dan suggests a warehouse rave in Hackney, but Farley is scared of groups of people taking drugs and has never been further east than Liverpool Street. Just as we're losing hope, someone bites. Felix, a friend from school who was in the year below me, who I've always had a gigantic crush on. He speaks of a massive rave in Cobham and tells me it's not one I want to miss. He asks me to bring female friends. Farley agrees to go as it's our only option and she knows how much I fancy Felix. She's taking one for the team, being my wing woman, going to the party for the greater good of my vagina. It's a mutual, fair, and successful system of turn-taking which we've long used. Having always both been single, I sacrifice my night to help her pursue a boy. I bank this act of goodwill and can cash it in at any point to have her do the same for me. It's shagging democracy. It's swings and roundabouts. We arrive at the large, detached house in Surrey, the footballer's wives' belt, to find very much not a rave, but instead a sort of sedentary oven pizza party made up of ten intertwined couples and one burly bloke in a rugby shirt who is playing with the family Labrador. Hello, I say tentatively. Is Felix here? He's gone to the shop to get vodka, the monotone rugby player replies, not looking up from the dog. Weren't you in the year above us at school? A horsey-faced girl with corkscrew curls asks. Yeah, I say, gingerly helping myself to a square of pepperoni. Were none of your friends free tonight? Felix appears with a clanking carrier bag. Hey, he shouts, outstretching his arms for a hug. Hi, I say, giving him a hug. This is Farley. Everyone here is in a couple? I mutter out of the side of my mouth. Yeah, Felix says. We were expecting a more diverse crowd, but loads of people who said they were going to come haven't come. Right. We'll have fun, though, he says, putting his arms round both of us. Three musketeers. The next few hours pass with a chummy, drunken ease, enough to make me think that the long road to Cobham may have been worth it. Felix, Farley, and I go to the conservatory and play drinking games, and we chat and laugh. At one point, he puts his arms round me, and Farley and I exchange the briefest half-smile and flicker of eye contact with her, enough to make her go take a fake phone call upstairs to leave us alone. I couldn't have loved her more. Can I talk to you somewhere quiet? He asks. Sure, I say, smiling. He takes my hand in his and walks me out to the garden. This is awkward, he says as I sit on a plastic chair and he hops from foot to foot. Why, just say it. I really fancy your mate Farley, he says. Is she single? In a nanosecond, I weigh up how much of a good person I am. No, I reply, deciding I've got plenty of time left in life for personal growth. No, she's not single. Fuck, he says. Is she in a relationship? Yes, a very serious one, I say gravely, nodding. With a boy called Dave. But she was making out in conversation like she was single? Well, they're not together anymore officially, I ad-lib. But they're still kind of a thing. It's very full on. She's on the phone to him right now, in fact. You know how it can be at New Year. Thinking of all your regrets and the things left unsaid and so on and so forth. Anyway. She's definitely not ready to move on with anyone. Farley returns to the table bouncily, bottle of wine in hand. A deflated Felix excuses himself to go to the loo. Did you snog him? She asks excitedly. Was I interrupting? No, he fancies you and he's asked if you're single and I've said no because I'm a bad person and I don't want you to get off with him. 
So I've said you're in a complicated on-off relationship with a boy called Dave, and it's all very upsetting and you're not ready to move on with anyone. Okay, she replies. Is that okay? Of course it's okay, she says. He's not my type anyway. We hear the footsteps of Felix. I said you were just on the phone to Dave, I garble in a whisper. Yeah, she speaks up as Felix sits back down. So anyway, yeah, that was Dave on the phone just now, she says robotically with all the nuanced subtlety of a character in Acorn Antiques. Again? What did he say? Oh, same old, same old, wants me back, thinks we can make it work. And I'm like, Dave, we've been here before. I did feel something, though, even though we aren't together. It just makes it all the more obvious to me that I'm definitely not ready to move on with anyone, she parrots. Felix chews his lip aggressively, then downs the rest of his wine in one. Nearly midnight, he says, and leaves the table to head into the house. As we chant the countdown, I stand in the heavy, dull, cream suburban living room belonging to the family of this boy I have never met, and I swear to never, ever plan an evening around a potential conquest again. We stare at the flat-screen television, playing out the BBC coverage of red-cheeked, drunk people in scarves cheering on the South Bank, and I yearn to be there. Big Ben strikes at midnight. Auld Lang Syne plays. Then, for some reason I don't think I will ever be able to fathom, everyone in the room starts slow dancing like it's the last song at the disco, apart from Felix, who is at the other side of the room sulkily playing a game on his phone. I turn the brass handle of the mahogany antique drinks cabinet and help myself to a bottle of whiskey. I look over at Farley, who has the family's black Labrador on its hind legs to make it stand up, its paws in her hands. They too slow dance to the funereal sway of Auld Lang Syne. We've missed the last train back to London, so I stand outside the house and ring some local taxi companies for a quote to get home, but they're all too expensive. We are trapped in Surrey for at least eight hours in a house full of couples and a crush who doesn't fancy me, all from the year below me at school. I re-enter the seventh circle of suburbia and see Farley and the miscellaneous rugby player necking up against the fridge before sneaking into the airing cupboard. I go to the garden to chain-smoke the rest of my cigarettes on my own. Where's Farley? Felix asks, who's had the same idea as me. I can't be bothered with the charade anymore. She's in the airing cupboard with that rugby player guy, I say expressionlessly before taking a glug from the whiskey bottle. What? What about Dave? I don't know, I say, lighting my cigarette and exhaling smoke into the cold, still night air. She and Dave are very complicated, Felix, and the sooner you realize that, the better. It's up, it's down, it's on, it's off. But she said it was on an hour ago, he replies in outrage. Yeah, well, I think he probably rang again, and they probably had another fight, and she probably realized she was over it, actually. Great, he says, sitting down on the garden furniture next to me and taking a cigarette. This is the worst New Year's Eve ever. Yeah, I say. We watch the last of Surrey's fireworks in silence. It is. 10th November Dear anyone I've ever met and a few people I've never met, Forgive the group email I feel absolutely no repentance for. Sorry for the shameless self-promotion I feel absolutely no shame about. I am emailing you because there's a vanity project I have been working on for all of a fortnight, and I feel all of you owe it your time, money, and attention. I am hosting an evening of music, spoken word, and film in an event called Lana's Literary Salon, taking place in an abandoned car park in Leightonstone. The idea is that the evening will evoke the mind-expanding conversational traditions of the Oxford Union with the atmosphere of Noel's house party. To begin, there will be some spoken word poetry written by India Towler Bags on the subjects of her recent life-changing haircut, the difficult choice of selecting her default web browser setting and finding her way back to herself through a mix of ayahuasca ceremonies and Zumba classes. She will perform all her work with a slight Jamaican accent, despite attending Cheltenham Ladies College. 
As most of you already know from a steady stream of spam on Facebook, Ali has started his own political party, Young Clueless Liberals. So he'll be reading his manifesto aloud, followed by a discussion on stage with journalist Foxy James, T4 MTV News, about his three principal aims for the party. First-time buyers, student fees, and the reopening of Fabric Nightclub. You'll be able to sign up for the party at the venue. Then, the headline act, my short film. No One Minds That Ulrika Janssen is an Immigrant explores the themes of cultural identity, citizenship, and sovereignty in a future dystopian setting. After the three-minute film ends, Foxy will interview me on stage about it for two hours. We will reference the film and its crew, mainly my family, as if it is a universally recognized piece of work and speak with show-busy, eye-raleigh, in-jokey camaraderie about behind-the-scenes stories as if I were Martin Scorsese giving a director's commentary on Goodfellas. There will be craft beer, brewed by my flatmate on the balcony of our Penge new build. The death of Hackney tastes like a sort of fizzy marmite and smells like a urinary tract infection and is yours for $13 a bottle. Enjoy. There will also be a bucket circulating in which you can charitably donate as little or as much as you want to, a really worthwhile cause. Me. The sequel to Ulrika is currently in pre-production, and I want to get it made as soon as possible. But I don't want to get a boring job like everyone else. Much like Kerouac, I'm just not a morning person. Thank you so, so much for your support with this. I will literally love every single one of you who turns up, except for people I don't know that well, who I will greet in a cursory way, then say, oh my God, why is he here? I literally haven't even seen him since primary school. I think he's obsessed with me, to my friends. May art be with you, Lana, XX.